So the um, reason I'm doing this is because uh, in addition to doing authoritative DNS, uh, we, so we host 550 of the top level domains on our authoritative side, including ones for 130 countries, and we provide backend infrastructure for two of the root name servers and so forth. So on our authoritative side, we've been the largest DNS network for uh, almost 30 years. Uh, on the recursive side, though, um, we hadn't really seen a reason to do anything for a long time. And then uh, Google started hassling the uh, European privacy regulators wanting a one-off exemption from GDPR so that they could keep snarfing up people's uh, click trails through the 8.8.8.8 recursive resolver. Um, and you know the regulators were saying, of course you can't have that. And then Google would come back to them and say, but this is critical internet infrastructure that can only be supported through the sale of advertising, blah, 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 right? Anyway, so regulators were coming to us and saying, well, you know, you, we don't think this is necessary. We think that it should be able, it should be possible to do recursive DNS without um, snarfing up everybody's personal data and selling it, uh, but we can't prove it. We're just regulators, right? And so. We went around to our, our donors, and uh, a bunch of them were enthusiastic about having us set up a GDPR-compliant recursive resolver that wouldn't collect any data at all. So that's what we did. Uh, it's called Quad9. It's on 9.9.9.9, courtesy of IBM. Uh, and IBM doesn't have any, that was a donation from IBM. It belongs to us now. There is no. There's no quid pro quo to IBM for that. Um, uh, and it's also on 2620 uh, FEFE. -E. Um, so uh, as you'll see in the talk, IPv6 is surprisingly stable and performant. Uh, so any place you have IPv6, you should use it. Uh, OK, so lessons learned and things that we think we know as a result of going through all this. Dane is going to save everybody's life. Um, there are huge, huge problems with certificate authorities. Uh, that's just not going to fix itself. It gets worse and worse over, the, over time. We've known this for 20 years. Dane is the solution to that. The problem is that the IETF is really, really slow. So Dane basically only works on SMTP right now. We desperately need Dane on IMAP, DNS, RTP, Jabber, so forth. Right? Things that right now get secured using uh, CA certs. Um, so there are the three RFCs that define it. Basically, Dane is self-signed certs slammed into DNSSEC uh, signed zones. Right. So if you want to go to a resource that you're finding through the DNS, you also get the appropriate cert for that thing, and it's all signed all the way down. So um, privacy. Uh, if you want your DNS to be private, you really, really want to run your own caching resolver. So if you're on a laptop, you can run a caching resolver on your laptop. It'll give you a little bit of enhanced privacy in that at least you'll have an answer locally for things that you go to often. It'll give you some more security in that you'll be a little less vulnerable to man in the middle attacks. You'll be able to do your own um, uh, sorry, jet lagged. QName minimization, where when you send a query out to an authoritative server, you only send the portion of the query that that server can answer. You don't just gratuitously send your entire query to somebody who isn't going to be able to answer that query and is only going to be able to give you a referral, right? So, um, all due respect to the folks in the room who make their living by uh, snarfing up DNS queries from in front of other people's name servers and selling the data, um, you can prevent that portion of the leakage of your data um, and other people's monetization of it by, like, for instance, if you're going to the root, you only query for the TLD that you need for the next step. And then when you go to the TLD, you only query for the second level that you need for the next step. Um, all right, there are a couple of uh, online tutorials there. Well, this is a tutorial about how to use 
uh, Stubby, which is the most common uh, encrypting interface for a uh, local uh, caching resolver. And this is a, a GitHub repository of a sort of pre-built uh, Docker uh, installation of one. Um, EDNS extended client subnet. This is one of the real evils that we run into. Um, and it's really prevalent now. It's, uh, if you start looking at queries going across the internet, the vast majority of them are doing extended client subnet now. So this is where you send a query to a recursive resolver. And the recursive resolver, instead of just doing the queries it needs to do to get you an answer, it gratuitously sends your IP address or a subnet that encloses your IP address onto authoritative servers. So now, not only is your query going to places it doesn't need to go, as a full query, it's also got your IP address attached to it. So the theory here, the, the way this gets marketed as being necessary, is CDN operators say, oh, well, we couldn't possibly give you optimized performance if you didn't tell us your IP address. Um, worked fine before this, uh, but of course they don't make as much money if they can't sell your IP address to advertisers. So um, the problem here is any recursive resolver you use, you're going to have to trust not to do this. Uh, a way of testing this, of course, is do a query through a recursive resolver to something you're authoritative for and uh, pick up the query coming in from the recursive resolver and see whether it's passing IP addresses. Right? Um, you should also know that there are people who are, there are CDNs out there that are starting to penalize people who don't give them their IP address, right? So there are people who are starting to try and normalize this in the sense of um, not answering queries that don't come with an IP address or giving them purposely degraded performance. So this is, this is a political issue and a big one, and it's pretty invisible to most people. Um, because what you get is um, commercial recursive resolver operators telling users, oh, we've got to do that. It's for your benefit. And you know, if we didn't, you would be the loser here, right? And so users wind up thinking this is a good thing rather than realizing just how bad it is. Um, fingerprinting. Uh, state of the art has gotten to the point where you can fingerprint OS and browser just from the DNS queries that they do loading a page, right? So the same page, web pages getting loaded by different browser OS combinations are going to do things in different orders, different ancillary queries, that kind of thing. So fingerprinting is possible just from the DNS stream. OK, um, so you've got DNS over TLS and DNS over HTTPS. One of the big things that we were doing with Quad9 was proving that you could do this stuff encrypted. Uh, prior to this, um, there, was, uh, there was only a protocol called DNSCrypt that was proprietary and uh, just worked with uh, OpenDNS. And it's okay. Um, it's not perfect. No protocol is perfect, but it's not bad. Uh, the problem <laughs> is that um, it's caught up in uh, politics and is because of the politics, it, it will never be a standard, right? It is proprietary. Uh, and so the world has left it behind. Um, there aren't new DNS crypt installations going in, and everything else that's growing is not DNS crypt. So that leaves DNS over TLS, which is sort of the normal regular standard, and DNS over HTTPS, which is the Trojan horse fake standard uh, for snarfing up your data by um, CDNs, right? So the CDNs are pushing DNS over HTTPS, which again allows them to do fingerprinting and all kinds of stuff. The HTTPS libraries leak a tremendous amount of information that's completely unnecessary to a DNS transaction. DNS over TLS doesn't send anything extra that's not needed. Um, so what the DNS over HTTPS folks are trying to do 
is basically lock in your DNS as well as a, a lot of your web browsing and again give you this sort of trade-off. Like if you use their DNS, um, they can see what you've looked up and they can start to push web pages at you before your browser asks for them and they can start to push additional things to you in, addition, in advance of you having done lookups, right? Um, it's a good way to use up bandwidth. It makes them look very performant relative to their competitor, but it's, there are always going to be competing CDNs out there, right? And you're not going to be choosing your DNS recursive resolver based on what CDN the web page you're next going to load is hosted on because you just don't know and that'd be a huge hassle. Um, so be very, very skeptical of DNS over HTTPS, right? If you see reputable people who don't have any money coming to them from a CDN operator or somebody who monetizes uh, personal information, then sure, listen to that argument, but otherwise be skeptical. Um, performance is actually fairly simple. Um, We've got this huge network for doing authoritative. We're in 200 data centers around the world. Um, and so we're very close to users and we thought that would make a huge difference in performance with the recursive DNS. And it turns out it doesn't really. Um, you know, the difference is not that huge. So, uh, you know, all of the big Anycast recursive uh, DNS networks give essentially roughly equivalent performance, right? Um, there are places where Cloudflare is a little faster than we are. Uh, uh, there are places where we're a little faster than OpenDNS. But in real world terms, you know, somebody's DNS query getting answered in, you know, 15 milliseconds instead of 10 or 10 instead of 5, it, it really doesn't matter, right? Um, even when stuff is uh, sort of uh, cumulative delay on a bunch of lookups on a page or something. You know, the user is, is starting to read the page Well, DNS lookups and ads are loading and junk further on down. It's not that big a deal. Um, the, the thing that makes the huge difference is uh, having caching, having large caching, and having caching that lots of other users are using. So what this says to me is you always want to have a local cache at the edge of your own network. If you're in an enter enterprise or something, probably you want that kind of hierarchical. You want one of those at every site and then have those uh, either go straight to recursive externally or in a hierarchy to sort of a big one for your enterprise as a whole. Um, to the degree that you can get a bunch of users sharing a cache, um, the first person to get an answer is going to have gotten it on behalf of a whole lot of other people. The other thing, there are a whole lot of, again, sort of CDNs and advertisers and that whole crowd who try to do cache busting and they try to do, you know, TTL zero on every response so that they'll see every single query and know exactly who's loading their ad and so forth, right? If you control your own cache, you can control a lot of that, right? If you can control your own cache, you can artificially say, to hell with this TTL zero, we're doing a TTL of a day on everything, right? Um, at which point you've got a day between each time you leak information. Um, and also, you're not having to go out <laughs> to get it over and over and over and, and have, make people wait each time. Um, so again, your own cache that you can tune and you can control what's, what's leaking out and you can see how much it's leaking out, it's a really good thing. Um, security. Uh, there are a lot of, s of folks who, you know, say having centralized recursive resolvers is a problem in and of itself. And I wouldn't say that that's the case. Um, and there's sort of, this is a trade-off. The, if you have a centralized resolver, it means that when there's a problem, it's going to get solved quickly. But on the other hand, a lot of people will have been affected by that problem before it gets solved. So that's a trade-off. But the second thing, um, we and OpenDNS both do uh, malware uh, filtering, right? So you can, if you're sending a query to Quad9, optionally have it uh, block 
any response that would have taken you to like a drive-by site or a phishing link or you know whatever um, so we get feeds from 30 different threat intel providers that we blend together and we do um, sort of reputational scoring on those um, because they're not all great <laughs> uh, many of them have a lot of false positives and we so we wind up with um, a sort of a whitelist in addition to catch false positives there's a whole lot of tuning that happens there uh, the open DNS one is the, the Cisco Talos one which is also used by quad 9 um, uh, so it it also works well um, but that's just like that whole hassle is manual and if you had to pay for it it'd be very expensive and it's not, it's not something you really want to be doing if you can avoid it. Um, but again, you know, if you use that as sort of an external service, you've got your own caching, you're not sending anything you don't need to uh, uh, out to the recursive resolver, uh, and you pick, um, you pick a recursive resolver that has privacy policies and transparency and so forth that you're happy with, then, you know, that seems to me like a pretty clear win. Um, okay, authenticity. Uh, knowing what the name server you're talking to is, is important so that you're not getting man in the middle. Um, Dane, of course, is the gold standard for that, where you can authenticate the server that you're talking to as you're talking to it. Um, DNS over TLS is a good first step. Um, DNS crypt has something in there for doing that. Uh, you know, in theory, key pinning would work if it were supported in clients, which it isn't, to the best of my knowledge. Although, there may be some way of hacking that in. Um, and we've got this sort of all or nothing thing that the DNS over HTTP folks are trying to do. So between DNS over HTTP and extended client subnet, we're getting, like the politics are starting getting to the point where you, your ability to reach some websites may be gated upon your willingness to give personal information. And again, I feel like the sooner the better that politically we can steer away from that and make that obviously unacceptable, um, you know, better, better way of going. Um, reliability. Uh, all of these big Anycast ones have multiple IP addresses. Ideally, what you want is multiple v4 and multiple v6. Um, you have to hope that they know what they're doing with Anycast and are not just routing <laughs> all those addresses back to the same clusters. Uh, <laughs> got different talks on that. Uh, but you can also just use two different ones, right? So um, the problem here is you see a lot of people on like in forums online saying, oh yeah, you know, we did Quad9 and Cloudflare. The problem here is now the client is sitting there sending queries and they don't know on a per query basis which one went to which provider, right? I mean, they're, unless they're pcapping their own traffic, they don't know which of those name servers got used for any given query, yet those have radically different privacy policies, right? So. Um, you want to make sure that you're okay with the privacy policies of the ones that you're using and that they're roughly similar, right? If you're going to use multiple providers. No problem with using multiple providers. It's probably a good idea. Um, but, like, just be aware that different providers have radically different policies and you want to be aware of what those are. Um, and, you know, exercise a little bit of... Um, judgment, right? And don't just take things at face value. If somebody says something on Twitter about what their policy is, you want to probably actually go read the fine print, right? Um, the other thing, uh, like I said before, IPv6 transport is often uh, more lightly loaded. Um, and where IPv4 and v6 are getting served by different resources, <laughs> v6 one is often over-provisioned relative to load. So, um, you know, your mileage may vary, but what we see is people getting much better performance on the v6 side than the v4 side. So, um, 
like don't just pop in the v4 address and call it done put in the v6 address put it in as higher priority and see where you get um, and then lessons learned um, as an organization if you're operating servers either authoritative or recursive or caching um, having some visibility collecting some statistics keeping a rotating pcap uh, buffer whatever so that you can go back and see what's going on is really really useful um, we uh, on the authoritative side on the recursive side we're not doing any of that and that's like an acknowledged weakness right if we're not capturing any data it also means that it's really hard we can't really go back in time and see what happened when something happens right um, on the authoritative side we're doing that for you know hundreds of different organizations and they they want us collecting data so that they can tell what's going on when there are problems so on the authoritative side we're following the privacy policies that are dictated by the people we're serving and so by and large what we're doing for many of them is keeping a one week rotating uh, PCAP buffer uh, of the traffic into their servers and that's really saved our asses a lot of times um, so if you need to boil down statistics if you're a service provider um, boiling down IP addresses at the BGP uh, advertised level is probably good enough um, for if once you're out of the we've still got a PCAP with an actual IP address in it if you're if you're just trying to keep statistics but for any enterprise you know you can keep the whole thing disk is cheap um, trying to collect everything like PCAPs for a while is great but then once you start trying to boil things down into a database um, the numbers get really big really quick and um, so you got to figure out in advance what you're gonna capture because otherwise your indexing and so forth will just kill you um, so uh, time series databases are good relational databases simply don't work for this stuff right you can't add millions of records per second to a relational database and have it be usable right and you know it, that's not going to get better faster than traffic levels increase right it's a problem that's sort of been getting worse and worse over time um, in general there aren't a lot of good pre-built tools for this stuff unless you're very small um, there's something called DSC that for a sort of small enterprise is is great it doesn't scale but um, if if you're small and not going to grow a lot it gives a lot of nice visualization and logging and ability to do queries and so forth um, so a lot of one of the really frustrating things is a lot of people will be operating something small and they'll get really used to using DSC and all the sort of neat knobs and tools it gives them and then <laughs> they'll get into a large situation and suddenly feel like they're blind uh, there isn't a lot to be done about that because DSC depends upon having a heavily indexed relational database of stuff that it can lunge away at um, uh, so our big limitation is we're not a software development shop, right? And so we're dependent on what software developers do in terms of implementation. And they often don't have any sense of operational requirements or what's needed for doing security and figuring out what's going on in a security context. So we have a lot of kind of odd conversations with software developers where they can't understand why we'd want to be able to keep some statistic or uh, you know go back and look at, at what's going on whatever um, and obviously um, it, there's there's a lot of performance that gets tied up in that right they want to be able to run fast and that often means letting a lot of stuff slide by um, looking at CPU cycles on our gear out there 80% of the CPU cycles are dedicated to logging 20% to actually serving packets again that's on the authoritative side because people want to know what's going on they want to be able to backtrack problems um, and IPv6 for a long time was the thing that software developers just couldn't wrap their heads around supporting now it's TCP uh, in the DNS 
there are a lot of software developers who are still thinking in a very um, uh, uh, stateless mindset, right? So even their TCP implementation doesn't really use TCP efficiently. It's not looking at long-lived flows. It's not uh, prioritizing uh, top talkers. There are a zillion things that can be done to improve performance uh, of TCP. Essentially, at this point, DNS, there's no question at this point that DNS is going to be over TCP, right? DNS over TCP is already, if not predominant, it's the most important traffic for name servers that matter. Okay, so between big resolvers and big authoritative, it's all TCP. And shortly it'll all be TCP encrypted, right? Um, so uh, everybody's got to be paying attention to that and, and realizing what that means, right? So if you've got like debugging tools that depend on TCP being unencrypted UDP, those can't be applied to DNS traffic that matters anymore. So, um, all right, that was all I had. Uh, it is 4.29. One minute for questions, yes. Right, which also means that different analytic tools can look at the same data stream, which is great. And yes, we've, we've been pushing software developers to standardize on it. Yes? Yeah. yeah. I, I think you're right. I think this is a fairly new issue, and it's very low visibility right now. Um, and also, uh, the CDN operators, or, or the content networking folks, are very used to being the good guys in the net neutrality fight. Um, and this is an instance of them behaving abusively. Uh, so, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think that might even out the net neutrality fight a little bit as well. So, yeah. One more question before I go. No? Okay, I'm off. See y'all later. <laughs>